Sorry. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. This is our inaugural speaker series. Um, I am Julie Campbell. I'm the vice chair of the Sustainability Advisory Group uh, for the City of Highland Park. Our mission is to kind of, you know, encourage and educate the, the community about sustainable technology to kind of better our environment. So tonight we're going to talk about heat pumps, and we have with us three wonderful experts in the area um, that will be able to kind of give you some educational background to begin with, and then we'll follow with kind of a question and answers section. Um, once that is done, or actually if you're not interested in staying for the full question and answer section behind me, we have three local vendors that have come today so that you can talk to them directly and ask your questions about your specific house and your needs. Um, we solicited many vendors from around the area, so there's no particular reason why these three vendors are here. They've just chosen to come and share their knowledge and expertise as well. So I would like to kick it off by introducing you to Wayne Beals, and he's going to moderate our session for tonight. I'm uh, much louder. <laughs> um, thanks for coming out this evening. I, my name is Wayne Beals. I work as a real estate broker and a consultant. So I work in the development industry. Uh, so I help developers choose what to build in the various neighborhoods in Chicago. Uh, one of the big parts of my job is helping them make more competitive housing, housing that gets consumer demands a little bit better. And so one of the trends in our industry is moving heating and cooling systems to heat pumps. And so tonight, I've been asked to come out and moderate a conversation uh, with our two experts here uh, to chat with you guys about why heat pumps are popular, what's the difference between heat pumps and gas equipment, uh, why people are making the transition, some of the economic factors, some of the health factors, and clear up uh, misconceptions and misinformation around different pieces of systems. Uh, so without further ado, so Steve is a, uh, i make sure I get his title right. He is the department chair of HVAC at Lake County College. So uh, you don't get any closer to a HVAC scientist than Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim Nigro, uh, she is the founder and head of uh, Nigro, uh, uh, right? Studio Nigro Architecture. Uh, and Kim has been doing that for about 18 years. And Studio Nigro has, uh, as their goal is to build more energy efficient buildings and homes. Uh, so she's uh, encountered heat pumps quite a bit in her line of work. Um, so we're going to kick this off a little bit with Kim here to talk a little bit about housing, the anatomy of a house and uh, describe to you some considerations around your building's envelope uh, when you start thinking about the HVAC. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna give kind of a big picture information about, before you dive into thinking about whether switching to a heat pump is right for your home, how does it relate to the house as a system? because every little, all the pieces and parts of our house do work together. So um, the most important thing to think about is what we call the envelope of the house. I don't know if this, uh, yeah, it's is it working? Oh, whoops, I advanced. Um, so, you know, basically this green line, whoops. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Did I do something? Yeah, no, it's <laughs> Um, so basically, it's the it's the thing that's the barrier between what is your inside conditioned space and what are what is Mother Nature doing outside. So when we talk about you know conditioning the interior of a home, there are a lot of things that play into that. Not just the HVAC equipment, but how is this wall built? How is it insulated or not? How is this? What's the barrier between the roof and the sun beating down on it is the insulation here in the attic level or is it up at the roof level is this ventilated or not is there equipment in it like in this picture which is really not ideal <laughs> um, so we have to think about before we can decide how we're going to heat and cool the inside of the space we have to know what's mother nature throwing at us at our envelope so 
um, they're not separate things. So if you're thinking about upgrading your heating and cooling system, our recommendation is always, is there anything you can do within budget um, to address anything about your envelope that's not performing well? Do you have really old leaky windows? Okay, that's kind of a big ticket cost item that might not be your thing to go to first, but are there places that you can air seal or uh, have a drafty couple of doors? Doors are pretty, that's a pretty low hanging fruit item. So if you can look at where you're losing heat or cooling that you're spending good hard earned money on and address some of those leaks, that's the first thing you can do. The second thing is, can you improve your insulation? The attic is always the first place. We lose most of our heating through the roof of the house, much more so than the walls. Um, so we can properly address the lid on the house, which is the attic, by keeping that insulated well, dealing with humidity. That's going to help you have better performance of the equipment and need less of it when you go to heat and cool the space inside. Does that make sense? Um, and the other thing about it is this envelope is also, if it's well sealed, the last thing to think about is how healthy is this air inside? Today's homes, new homes are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. You may be hearing stories about this on the news. We're, we're doing a better job of air sealing so that we can not lose the conditioned space we've created. But with that comes the need to ventilate. Um, my old leaky bungalow in Portage Park leaks like a sieve. So I have very good natural ventilation. I also have very high heating bills. <laughs> so I know what I'm doing wrong. We try to air seal. We've done some insulating. We've brought the, the loads down, the need for heating and cooling down by doing what we can. Um, but it, once we get to a certain point where we're real, really well sealed, um, you know, people who have been in fires in California recently know that sometimes the outside air is much less healthy than your inside air. During COVID, we all started thinking more and more about how healthy is our inside air. And um, you might live next to a highway. I mean, there's a lot of things outside where the air in your house actually is cleaner. So just opening a window is not always the best ventilation system. So if we are want to save money and seal and insulate the house well, we also want to think about how to um, ventilate the air and keep it healthy and keep and not lose energy in the process. So energy recovery ventilators. Yeah. So what we yeah. use is a product called energy recovery ventilators. So you're recovering the heating or cooling before you're shooting that air outside again or bringing it in. Bring you're not bringing in freezing cold air to the warm house. You just heat it. So um, that's kind of the last piece of the system. And the last thing I'll say about healthy indoor air is that. Um, We've been moving, a lot of my clients have been wanting to move to electric appliances like heat pumps because they're wanting to eliminate fossil fuel burning in their house, which has been proven to drastically uh, reduce the health of your indoor air. Lots of gas fire appliances backdraft are not properly ventilated, have leaky knobs on stoves, and those are big contributors to childhood asthma. So there's a lot of research out there now about how equipment like heat pumps and other electric equipment can help improve that indoor air quality for all of your family. Um, so the other thing to think about, like I said, is a lot of people when they hear about heat pump technology or other so-called so green or energy efficient technology, you know, some people think, oh, that everybody wants us to throw solar panels on our roof. That's actually the very last thing to do. <laughs> it's kind of the jewelry on the whole situation. Thing, the very oops, lost it. And the very first thing to do is take a look at what you can do affordably for your house. There are a lot of tax credits available now. You can do things where you do a replacement of one piece of equipment this year and take the full tax credit. Do the next piece of equipment next year, take the tax credit again. So look at how you can phase out the work you might need to do. And the first thing is to look at what needs replacing anyway. So if I'm going to have to replace a stove that's going out or a furnace that's on its last legs or a hot water heater, that's the opportunity to, you've got to buy new equipment anyway. What would be the more energy efficient, 
uh, better indoor air quality for my home um, equipment to change to. Um, so like I said, you know, look into the tax credits, um, take a look at your envelope so that when you put this new equipment in, you don't need five tons of heating and cooling. If you've dealt with your envelope and you have better insulation and air sailing, I've done houses where we started with five tons of equipment and the new equipment was only three tons. So if you, you know, take care of the envelope better, you can buy less equipment. How's that? That's great. <laughs> you know, I think that one of the things that I tend to see quite a bit um, is people want to solve a problem with technology. You know, we want to make our home more comfortable by uh, getting a better air conditioner. And a lot of times comfort is more of a passive thing that comes from having inflation. Uh, the analogy I give people is, you know, you wouldn't go outside on a winter day without a parka on, right, and expect to be warm. You, know, you you would go outside and expect to be cold in any case. And a lot of our houses just don't have a coat on. They're literally walking around outside in the wintertime <coughs> without a coat and a sweater. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So a lot of times adding uh, insulation to your home, air sealing your home, approaching the strategies before you consider your mechanical equipment is going to save you money in the short run and the long run. You're going to buy less equipment, number one. And then number two, you're going to fuel less equipment to operate that home. So there's short-term and long-term savings by considering conservation prior to um, to making mechanical changes. Uh, speaking of mechanics, Steve uh, is going to give us a little bit of a rundown here on um, the state of mechanicals today and, and historically and how our houses have been fueled for yes, I uh, over the years. You know, obviously none of us. Not all of us live in a brand new house, right? Most of our environment, most of Highland Park, most of the Chicago region is older homes that have been fueled by different fuel sources over time. So I don't like to see you do that. So this will give me a lot of, of an, an anatomy class, to be perfectly honest. And I, you know what? I may have to move. I hope that's not problematic, just so I can see what I'm doing here. Um, I'm starting here with air, I'm sorry, water source which is probably not where 90% of people are going to go. If you have hydronic heat, hot water, this might be an option. But there are some downsides, and most of them are costly. And it's only a cost for install. It's not a cost for operation. Operational costs are still going to be lower. No two ways about it. But the equipment's going to be more expensive. You're going to need a... Uh, uh, a well or a field of some sort where you can exchange heat. So the water sources, they're wonderful. They really do work really well. But again, money. This is this is what we're going to see most of. Backwards, aren't we? This is what we're going to see most of air to air or air to water. Now I'm going to flip to here, because this is very much what you're going to see at home, right? You've got a condensing unit outside, there's your air conditioner, here's your furnace, and there's an evaporator. Oops, I'm sorry, the evaporator on this guy is right here. Now, in a cooling mode, <clears throat> air conditioning, mechanical cooling, or heating just moves heat. We don't make it, we just move it. So we're going to take that heat from inside the space here and get rid of it out there the plus there's going to be some other technical issues on that but we're not going to leave we're going to leave that alone this is in a cooling mode which we're mostly familiar with we go there's our refrigeration circuit so now we're just going to break this down a little bit more and this one happens to be a heat pump because there's a reversing so now you still have an indoor coil. We are still in a cool mode because we are discharging cool air here, usually about 50 to 55 degrees, and we're getting rid of heat way out here, right? Basically, our cool mode. Here we are in a heating mode. So even when it's zero outside, there is sufficient heat in the air to give you a warm, leaving air temperature. 
Now, the best analogy, think about it this way. <clears throat> if you've got a, a freezer, a chest freezer, cold in there, right? Well, on the back side of it, it's hot, don't it? It's zero in there. How can we be producing heat on the outside? Well, that's exactly what a heat pump is. Now, the heat pump technology is right here, so I'm changing a lot. And if I go back to this guy, this, which is the heart of it, so to speak, the mechanical side, the compressor, they're becoming way more intelligent. So they can operate now between 10% of their capacity to 100% of their capacity and anywhere in between that. So now that gives us the ability to run this heat pump in a wide range of ambient condition. And that technology has actually been around for about 20 years, believe it or not. Oops, I hit the wrong one, didn't I? There we go. Heat mode, heat mode. Now, if you're gonna use a dual fuel, dual fuel meaning we're going to use, this as my heat pump, this guy's saying 10 degrees. You might have, this one's showing us electric resistive heat. Not the most efficient way to do it. Now you can't go to dual fuel, which means that you've got a heat pump with a gas fired uh, furnace. I will probably go with at least multi stage, probably modulating if you got the money for it. Best of all for us. No matter what, it can get the negative 30 outside, and you would still be at 75 degrees inside out. Wouldn't make any difference. But the second stage, when we, if I go back to this guy, well, second stage, when this is modulating and or variable capacity, then this becomes a little easier. Now, Here we are again at that circuit with the reversing mode and an energized in a heat mode. Outside, it's cold. It's cold, and we're absorbing heat out there. Now, mini splits, real popular nowadays, aren't they? <clears throat> They're kind of sweet, actually. There's a few manufacturers that do a really, really good job. The beauty of it is, is I can have five zones, one condensing unit sitting outside. I think it's up to five. There might be a few that are out there a little more than that. It is 100% refrigeration. And you can heat this zone and cool that zone at the same time. Pretty sweet, huh? So ductless mini splits are pretty, uh, pretty sweet and gaining a lot of popularity. They're a little pricey to buy. They're even pricier to install because of all of the hardware that goes in between the two pieces and the fact that there are multiples. Now these, this is just showing you a wall hung type, they, they come in a million different flavors. You can put it into a space above, you'd never even see it. You'd never even know it was a mini split, honestly. So this is another technology that's gaining a lot of popularity. And they do work quite nicely. Okay, so I put in a really, really complex one. Remember the, remember the water to water? There she blows. So here's how you can do it with water. If you have hydronic heat, this is all, and all these images were taken from two textbooks. Uh, they're both a Cengage, I believe, publication or something along those lines. But it gives you the ideas, right? If I have hydronic heat, I can go this far. If you got pockets deep enough, if you got enough land space to get a few wells in or a field to exchange heat, because the water by well by eight feet below grade, this neck of the woods is a pretty consistent 50 degree, no matter what time, winter or summer doesn't make it. And with that consistency, we were able to do a lot more with it. And Steve, I'm going to have a lot of questions. No, <laughs> that's you. Uh, you know, one of the things that Steve was uh, showing you display wise is this idea of moving heat versus making heat. Yeah, we don't make heat, we just move it. So, so when we think about 
freezer, for example. The inside of your freezer is very cold. The where is it moving that heat to? It's moving it to the inside of your house, right? It's taking heat from inside the box of the freezer and it's moving that heat into the into your home. So it's effectively heating your house with heat that's available in the box, making the inside of the freezer colder and colder. Your refrigerator is cold, but it's not as cold as the freezer. Right? So that makes your freezer, where what we're doing in this case is we're actually taking more heat from the freezer than we're taking from the refrigerator. And that sort of demonstrates this idea that you can take heat from cold air, if that makes sense to everybody, where it's fine. So I think people really get lost with this because like when it's cold outside, right, there's no heat. Is there heat? Oh yeah, there is. <laughs> I mean, it has to go down to absolute zero before there's no, there's no heat. What's that, like negative 400 and so on degrees? Uh -huh. So, so there is heat outside, even when it's zero degrees. Absolutely. And we can harvest that heat to heat the inside of our home? Yes, we can. Now, one of the, uh, if, if I could just perhaps emphasize one thing, and that is that if you're planning on doing a heat pump, do the envelope test. Due diligence, man, you got to do it. Do the, do the envelope test, do the duct pressurization, do a heat load. Do you know how much heat is being lost or gained in that structure? So what Steve is talking about here is called lower door test. Has anybody ever heard of this before? So lower door test, what they do is they open your front door, they install a temporary door, and what they do is they're going to try and pull as much air out of your building as they can. And when they pull that air out, that air is coming from somewhere. It's coming from all the leaks in your house. And by doing that, they, they can determine how leaky your house is. They can actually come up with a map equation for how leaky your house is. Uh, Kim, can you, you talk a lot about the envelopes in your yeah. foundation. Can, can you expand a little bit on how like heating load can change from house to house? So um, I also tell my clients typically when start with a lower door test. We can't design a system if we don't know what where we're starting from. And to do the heat load calculations to know what is the wall, how well is it insulated, how is the roof, what are the what is the envelope, and so what how much heat are we losing? So once we know those pieces of information, we can design the equipment that fits that. Um, that lower door test is going to tell you how many times all of the air in your house is changed. How fast is it changing based on how much air you're sucking out of every little hole and crack in the house. So that helps the HVAC, you know, when you go to talk to a, a diligent HVAC installer, they will do what's called a manual J calculation, which tells them what, how much heating and cooling do I need to put in this space? Industry standard too, by the way. Right, based on how much it's leaking out. So that lower door test is really helpful and some settlers require it. I just want to oh, thank you. I don't, can you guys hear me okay or probably yes, not? Yeah. 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 Is that on? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. sorry. This, this was squealing at me, so. so um, yeah. So, you know, I, want, I want to turn back one more page. Um, so, an analogy I use to help people visualize this is, you know, everybody here has blown up a balloon. So when, when you blow up a balloon, it takes a lot of effort. You know, you gotta, you got your lungs are pushing air into that balloon. If it's a big balloon, you're, you're pretty tired after blowing. When you might be a little bit lightheaded. If that balloon is leaking, you're working even harder, right? You're having to make up for the air that's leaking out of the balloon. If that balloon leaks one time per hour, you have to blow it up one time every hour. If that balloon leaks seven times every hour, you have to blow it up every eight minutes, right? So when we think about a leaky house, it has to do the same thing. It has to heat the volume of air in your house over and over again, depending on how leaky it is. So that's why air tightness is really important. Um, so Kim, what is the, when you, your bungalow, do you know what the BTU load of it was when you bought it and maybe kind of approximately where it is now based on changes you've made? I'm going to use a client's bungalow since I'm the cobbler's children. Yeah, that has no situation. My, my husband's also an architect. We know exactly what's wrong with our house and we have not fixed it all. But for clients who uh, 
have a little deeper pockets. Um, one similar bungalow, same area as mine, brick walls, no insulation in the walls, uh, very little haphazard insulation in the roof. Um, we went from, uh, this is the example I mentioned before, they had five tons of heating and cooling equipment when we started this project, and now they're down to three tons. And that's about a 40% reduction yes. in the size of the heating equipment. Correct. And they have two heat pumps, just to kind of talk about the different, uh, the mini split versus different options of types of heat pumps. What they have, the inside unit looks like a typical furnace. But it doesn't have a heating element in there. It's blowing, it's moving the air. There's an outside unit that is the condenser, and that is either making cooling or making heating and bringing it into that inside unit that looks like a furnace. And they have one in the basement, we have a horizontal one in the attic. So we have two zones the second floor is heated and cooled by the attic unit. Sure. The uh, first floor and basement are heated and cooled by the larger three ton uh, unit. Um, and that is a ducted system. So there's duct work like you would see in any typical house. So, what kind of energy savings are they experiencing from this kind of generally speaking? Like, um, it, I mean, does the system run less? Does it, you know, Yes, I, and it also, should, just so you know, we had that, you know, really, really cold days this past winter. And they um, they did just fine. The house stayed warm. I think on that day when it was like 12 below for how many Jan days January straight? 16, 17. They got down to 66 at one point. Now, what we do for a lot of other clients, uh, I'm not totally answering your question, but we do put in an ele electric uh, resistance coil sometimes in that interior furnace looking air handler piece. It's about four hundred dollars. It's still electric, so we're still we've still gotten all the gas out of the property, but it's there for just your peace of mind. So when it's negative twelve for ten days in a row, and you are tired of being at sixty six, and you want to be at sixty eight or seventy, you can turn that on, and it'll blow warm air through the ducts that are already there. It's just a backup. So, so I'm going to pull this conversation back to Steve momentarily. So. Um, We've talked about furnaces that use gas, right? So a furnace burns gas, it heats the heat exchanger up, it makes heat, right? That air is blown across the heat exchanger, heats your home. We talked about air conditioning, right? There's a coil. It's blowing air across a coil. We're using a condenser outside, and we're, we're using refrigerant to move heat out of the home toward the outside of the heat, to absorb the heat. And discharge it outside where it's not problematic. So, so then, what what's a heat pump in this? Analogy? Well, a heat pump is really just an air conditioner running backwards. So okay. instead of it discharging the hot air outside, it's absorbing. It's just, they're changing roles. So there's a reversing valve you were pointing on your drawing. Reversing, right? And that reversing valve was now instead of moving heat from the inside to the outside. In the wintertime, that reversing valve allows you to move heat from the outside to the inside. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a lot of other components that go along with that, but I kind of try to simplify things because this is not an HVAC class. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're trying, mm -hmm. I'm trying not to make it. I'm trying hard not to make it an HVAC mm -hmm. class. But just to give you an idea about what you're going to encounter and the you know, things about the due diligence, that's yes, really, really important in order for this thing to perform correct so, size and one, one of the other ones is your your dock work nobody wants to talk about dock work <laughs> and it's it's up there someplace i don't care the air comes out well, so, really though so we we've talked about heat pumps now so i think everybody understands now heat pumps are basically air conditioners that are capable of running backwards and pulling heat from the outside in. and it's important to understand this concept of moving heat versus making heat so one of the things I point out to people is that everybody's familiar with the efficiency level of their furnace. You've got an 80% efficient furnace, a 90% efficient furnace. Heat pumps, when do they typically run at efficiency levels? Well, uh, then we were using SEER, seasonal energy efficiency ratio, I believe is what that stood for. And uh, a decent heat pump was in the 15 SEER range. Uh, and you'll also notice that <laughs> these things are getting bigger and bigger. 
So that little two ton condensing unit that you would use for exhaust air conditioning, okay, the same thing. You're still moving hay. It's only about that big. Well, not that bloody thing is this tall. And it's like that. And it's still only two tons. So the equipment's gotten bigger because it is it has to be able to absorb and reject heat more readily. It has to become more efficient at these tasks. So it's not bigger, it's literally just larger. So it's the same tonnage. And it's, it's physically, it's larger. physical characteristics are larger, but it is the same capacity. So um we talked about heat pumps now. So now we know in moving heat agents. One of the things I like to do to simplify things for folks is understand that you know a heat pump has a coefficient of efficiency. Yeah. You know? And that coefficient of efficiency on a typical heat pump is three, three point. Yeah, that's a three point something. I got to recall exact. So when we try to relate that to a percentage of like using one watt of power to move how much heat? What one watt? Well, volts times amps so yeah. equals watts. So there's Ohm's law, but that only works perfectly in resistance circuits. We'll leave that one alone. But um, a watt, one BTU is what three point one four one or is it four one four? I can't remember which it is because I is almost identical. <laughs> so so I get those two confused a lot. It yeah. happens when the the. The bottom line is that the way I, I look at it is that heat pumps can be 300% efficient. You'll get yeah. more than $1 out of it. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you buy $1 of power, you can move $3 of equivalent heat in or out of that building. With the right. So proper selection, proper engineering, all of these things have to go together. All of them. So when you buy $1 of gas, and you burn it in an 80% efficient furnace, yeah. you get 20% going up through the chimney. 80 cents in heat. Yes, right. Yes. So this is where the efficiency story starts to happen with heat pumps, is that effectively they're because you know, they're moving heat instead of making heat. Yeah. They're I was making gonna, it more efficient. That's a very good way of explaining it. And to circle back and answer your question about what my clients are saving in that sense, because in Illinois, electricity is comparably more expensive than gas. At the moment, they're an even exchange energy-wise. Um, but, well, I'll say they're saving a little and then they're saving a lot based on the rebates that they've been able to take advantage of. So, you know, costs to operate the new equipment is equivalent and getting less. So, so one of my clients, and this is a case of point, right? We can't make methane in sufficient quantity to heat our homes, right? We can make electricity on our rooftop that can be used to heat our homes. And so when you start thinking about energy in terms of it from renewable sources, if you electrify and move to a heat pump for your heating unit, theoretically, you can offset your electricity cost with so yes, and I wasn't trying to dissuade anyone from solar. I was simply saying that it's the icing on the cake. Once you've made your home perform more efficiently and using right. electricity, then taking advantage of again rebates and incentives and opportunities um, to then use clean energy from the sun is absolutely the icing on the cake. Yeah, or yeah. a way to make it almost free. So where people get confused, I think sometimes too, it's like I need heat in the winter time. And what do you mean I'm making? Am I making enough solar power in the winter time? You know, so maybe you can comment on that a little bit from an ethical standpoint. Yeah, I, well, in Chicago, we comment sure. doesn't allow you to sell back. You make excess. So other states have come from their own. There's so there's you know there's all the decisions we make ourselves. And there's also a lot of policy. That is moving and changing yes. pretty rapidly at the moment. So, um, you know, and other jurisdictions have moved quicker and it's even cheaper for them to make these decisions. We're kind of at, at a mid range here in Illinois and Chicago. So let's talk about just some conceptions. Like, because I, I have lots of relatives in Texas and Florida, right? They use heat pumps. They've been using heat pumps for a long time to keep their homes. Yeah. So so let's let's change. Like why 
I mean, I've been told maybe we could use them here in Chicago. Well, that's true because uh, in years past, okay, you, you date yourself a little bit with this sort of thing, but there was a time when a heat pump was absolutely useless at 40 degrees ambient. So when it got to 40 degrees outside, as soon as it dropped below 40, game over, you're going with your electric resistive heat. Well, that's no longer the case. And it, it has all to do with the size, the physical characteristics of the equipment that we were referring to before. That's how we're able to do it. And the ability of the mechanical equipment to modulate itself and govern its ability to create heat or move heat from place to place because first law of thermodynamics states that we cannot create heat we can only move it so can we start touching on this a little bit can i save money by switching the equivalent b2 b2 by switching from gas to electricity if you started to get into it um this is where I I have I felt like I'm raining on the parade a little bit, but I have to talk about the envelope because there have been people who have said, "Oh, I switched to a heat pump and my electricity bills have gone up." Well, if you if your house leaks like a sieve and you're reheating <laughs> that air ten times an hour, it's gonna it's not gonna be you know super efficient. Um, it might still be equivalent to the cost of operating your gas furnace. But um, this is where I caution to really look at your whole system of how your house is performing so that you can ensure you're not wasting money on heating and cooling more air than you need to. And, and you'll know that that equipment being sized less, buying less equipment will perform <laughs> and will save you money. The cost of insulating and air sealing can be pretty um, minor address the places that are most cost effective to do um, and it can say you can take that money and putting it into you know properly sized equipment so if i'm not waiting for my system to fail and i want to think strategically about replacing my hvac equipment long term um, what's the first step i should take i still say to have a and if it, you know, someone who is a, we'll do a lower door test, um, home performance auditor, we call them, to see how your house is performing. It's a couple hundred dollars to have that test done. And then when you talk to an HVAC um, professional, like the people in the other room, they will love it that you have this information to give them. And then when they go to calculate what size equipment you need, they'll, they'll already know the house is leaking about like this. And those um, energy auditors, home energy performance um, auditors, can also tell you, uh, they give you a report. Um, for, so, so to do a full audit beyond just a lower door test might be $800. Um, they'll give you a full report that says, here's 10 things you can do tomorrow to help your house perform better. And it's just really nice to have that information. You can work through that list, you know, as money and rebates become available. <laughs> Um, so that's always where I say to start. Um, if your air conditioner condenser is going to go tomorrow, what do you think? Can you just go replace that with a condenser doing nothing else? I probably would not. Not without the diligence. I mean, you have to do the heat load. You're going to have to do an envelope test. Because really, an envelope test is a depressurization. The, you should also be pressurizing the uh, the ductwork duct work is pressurized to 50 pascals. The building is depressurized to 25 pascals. And then you do a heat load. Now, once you have a heat load in hand, now you know what your equipment will do. Now, on top of that, the ductwork. Yeah. There's, there's that bad word again. Uh, you know? uh, and if it's not designed correctly. <laughs> this is my, my, my next question, right? Like, I mean, so there's people, I'm sure, in the home and in the audience that have boiler systems, that have one air conditioner, right? Maybe they have window units in the house. So uh, there's people in the audience with older heating and cooling ducts that are not ductwork. That were not designed for air conditioning to begin with. Yes, these are the most problematic. 
Right. So once again, my house. Yeah. So, so, so I would say that um, when when you're talking to your energy professional who's going to do your floor door test, right? They can also do a, a duct leakage test, right? Yes, is what you're talking about. Yeah, pressurization. Um, yeah. And they could also, uh, we talked about manual J. Those, those of you who know what manual uh, manual J is a very technical term for for a load size. Load calculation. Yes, yes. by that, ACCA. That that is the uh, way to calculate the amount of BTUs your your home is going to use. Yeah. Um, there's also a manual D. D. Manual S, right. manual P, and what we can keep going. Right. So manual D is, is a duct design. Yes. Right? Now, can we talk a little bit about duct design and some common problems you see in houses with duct work? Okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I feel very, very comfortable on this limb. So comfortable I got my lazy boy. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you that 80% of residential ducted systems are too small. Way too small. So if you're trying to get that BTU or trying to get those BTUs out of your air handler to the space, you might have a problem. And now uh, the Department of Energy saw to it that the, uh, okay, I'm not, how do I make this simple? They changed how we move air in the electric motor. They were permanent split capacitor motors. They've been around for ever and ever and ever. Well, now electronically commutated, okay, I won't get into that. But when properly sized ductwork, an ECM does save you money. But you go out and you buy this beautiful new air handler, right? And it's PSC controlled and it's variable and it's got all of the bells and whistles. And now you're spending actually more money on the movement of air because this motor will, to a certain extent, overcome the obstacles that exist inside the duct. So if it's not designed correctly, there will be problems. So, so I think the, the bottom line here is if your duct work that isn't well designed, like or, or is in the attic, as in Jim's first drawing, where the attic is a hot space in a lot of houses. But if properly insulated, properly installed, it's still okay. Yeah, if it's insulated. Yes. So if your duct work can't be easily insulated and can't be easily made better or can't be properly sized, What's the solution? I would go to many splitters. Right. I would go to many splitters. Well, and this is where he, you were talking about the mini split can be an expensive installation. Yes. But you're not spending any money on changing or installing ductwork. So right. it actually all in, you know, mini split versus a new ducted heat pump system can be comparable. And yeah. if you're living in the space, you don't want to destroy your ceilings. You can't get to where you would put ductwork. A mini split is a great solution, and we've done them on houses where we're not touching the existing HVAC system. The furnace is doing what it's been doing, the AC condenser outside, but we have a new space on the third floor we're finishing out, and we want to heat and cool that space properly. We put a mini split there, heat and cool it separately. Its loads are different anyway because it's on the third floor. It's going to need more cooling, less heating. So, um, or, you know, a rear addition that it's hard to get the duct work to extend out there and we can do a mini split that can even cool that space. And, and the zoning of it is nice, it's a bonus. And again, you're just not dealing with interrupting the house you're already living in with duct work. So if I have <clears throat> unfixable or hard to fix duct work, or I have improperly sized duct work, or if I have radiators and I want air conditioning and, and, and I want to take advantage of the benefits of a heat pump, a mini split is probably one of the easiest solutions for a setting. It's one of them, yes. Um, so one more one one more quick question for you is on the hybrid systems. Um, if you have a gas furnace and you want to switch to um, you want to add a heat pump, so so what's, a, what's a what's a hybrid? Can you discuss that? In yeah, as a matter of fact, we just uh, installed a few of them in the uh, in the lab over at CLC. And um, what we have there is a, a heat pump that is first stage. And we have a two stage gas uh, furnace. I think they're both two stage. So we, we technically have three stages. Eight. We're going to use our heat pump first. Now, the, the control strategies here are a little 
complex, so I'm kind of leave that one alone too. But it is definitely possible. So in the event that your heat pump or let's say something as simple as and every this has happened every a condenser fan motor outside goes on vacation at the worst possible. And you know it's four hundred and some odd dollars to change that plug. Well, all right. Well, if that happens in the middle of winter, you don't have any heat. So the dual fuel ain't such a bad idea at that point. When you think about the fact that if your gas-fired furnace is properly commissioned, meaning everything's been measured, the product of combustion on gas, natural gas, perfect combustion, perfect. I qualify it. Heat, water, vapor, and CO2. That's it. Okay, is carbon monoxide a part of it? Yes, because we don't live in a perfect world. So it is a possibility, you know, and it's a good one. So somebody with a pretty new, very high quality furnace and a yes. an older air conditioner could swap that out for a heat pump. Yes, and benefit from a heat pump most of the cooling, most of the heating season. Correct. They're going to spend a little money on a control strategy, but other than that, that's it is doable. So you're so, saying that they would use the heat pump for as long as they can to heat to the temperature they want to, then they would switch to the gas fired yeah, furnace. The, the yes, the control system would automatically switch when the heat pump wasn't yes. sufficient. Yes, but in the metro Chicago area, that's going to be about eighty-five to ninety-five percent of the entire winter. Right. So you can use a heat pump for most of your heating. Absolutely. So I want to open up to questions because I feel like there's probably a million of them. Absolutely. Anybody in the audience uh, have an here? I'll grab the mic. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Anybody have a question in the audience or anything on Zoom to? I don't see anything. Just in my house, I'm looking to have, if you will, a quarterback that can help in this process. And I've thought about it, and should it be an energy auditor? Should it be an architect that's involved with green technology like you? Should it be an HVAC contractor? Um, there are companies out there, I know, in Colorado, California, that do this, Black Power, a few others, and was wondering what's the best approach for a homeowner very interested in this, who can help? Well, I would say, what are your goals? Uh, are your goals to just have a more efficient HVAC system? Or are your goals to have an all electric house and stop using fossil fuels? Yeah, all electric. So, um, if that's your goal, um, I do electrification roadmaps for clients, even if there's not architecture involved. But I start with my energy auditor and I have them go start first. You can hire them separately. They go, you know, they give us all the information we need to start with. And then I help talk with my clients about. What is the low hanging fruit for you? What can we tackle first? What are the rebates for that? What can we tackle next year? And we create that roadmap. Um, I do wish there were more people doing this because <laughs> you don't really need an architect. You just need somebody who understands all how these things all relate to each other. But I we've been doing this in partnership with a contractor so that we can put costs on that roadmap so that you can actually create kind of a menu of what are the costs of each of these stages and therefore start to plan. If your goal was just the HVAC thing, I would still start with the energy auditor and then go um, and then go right to a reputable HVAC contractor who will do all of the calculations to properly science your system. Do your homework with the contractor too, by the way. With regards to homework for your contractor, do you guys have some good questions that people might ask their contractors to make sure that the, the vendor they're selecting um, knows what they're doing for that particular house? Oh, absolutely. 
there are a couple of organizations that are very good at uh, maintaining a level of excellence. ACCA is one of them. Uh, it stands for uh, Air Conditioning Contractors Association. They are the ones that produce and develop manual J, manual, okay, alphabet, right? Um, RSES is another one, Nate. Is North American Technician Excellence or something like that, but that's just certifying the tech, not the business. So I kind of like ACCA a little better for that sort of thing. There's also a real local company, uh, the ESCO Group. They're in Mount Prospect, and they yeah. um, they certify not only businesses but uh, colleges, and it's called HVAC Excellence. So yes, there are avenues that will help you there. So they should ask, are you ACSA? ACCA. ACCA accredited. That's what you should ask. Or do you have other accreditations? What, what other accreditations right. might you have? And the other first question I would ask is, do you run manual J calculations for all of your designs? Yeah. Can you do a heat load? Yeah. If they can't do that, if they don't know what you're talking about when you ask that question, <laughs> Go look elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, put your fingers if you were walking. Is anybody else? So thank you for all of the, you've got to do this first stuff. If you've done all that, Yay. right? So you roughly know what it is you want. The thing that I am not able to deconstruct from the presentation was we all have forced air systems effectively, right? So there's two circuits. There's one that moves the heat and one that moves the air. What do I have to do to the one that moves the air, if anything, if I change the way the heat moves? It's a great question. Well, um, when you say one part moves the heat and one part moves the air, are you talking about the heat source and then I know the cooling heat source? So I know how heat pumps work. I know how we would have to change some of the way that the heat gets moved around. But we have ducts that were patented in 1885. Oh, oh, you're in trouble. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they're big. Yes. I'm sure they're not too small. I yes, agree that they're too big. So probably what you had in the basement was this enormous octopus with these enormous ducts that use gravity to get the heat. So yes, you can't use that. Can't use any of it. And we're SOL. Yeah, I, I wouldn't no, that means I wouldn't say that. time for an for an install, you know, a, a properly designed installation. Well, we're, not, we're not stripping the walls out of a 150-year-old house. Yeah. Just you know, the pumps in. No, there's there's um so there, there's a couple things that every every house is obviously unique, right? And I think where these guys are probably going is you know, when we start thinking about delivering the heating and cooling to the spaces, that manual D, the, the dump design is really critical. Every house has spaces that can be used for delivery, uh, whether it's, you know, joist bays, whether it's attics, basements, soffits can be added to basements and, and, and knee walls to attics. Um, you know, so there, there's ways to creatively do it, but you do have to find in unique situations, in unique houses, you need to find uniquely qualified people to, to help with the design. So, and having said that, there's a product out there called uh, Space Pack. Ever heard of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Pricey, but very effective. So the uh, the thing I also to try to say is that when you're when you're dealing with an existing house, you're not in a perfect world, you know. So it's. When you have new construction, you can sort of conceive of everything, sizing all your ducts exactly right, sizing your system exactly right, doing everything exactly right. When you have an existing house, um, one of the products that comes to mind for somebody like this is like uh, air, the duct sealing systems, like air yeah. seal, right? Mm -hmm. Great stuff, right? Where you can basically, you know, maybe your ducts aren't sized properly, and they're you can, but you can still maybe use them if you air seal them. So that they don't leak into space, unconditioned spaces like choice bays and things like this. Um, so there are ways to seal ductwork that's not invasive, especially if you're in a historic home. So that's and it may be that your design solution isn't the most efficient. The equipment might need to be sized differently in order to push that air through 
improperly sized ducts, but because of a historic home, yeah, we're not going to tear them out. We're going to use as much of it as we can. So it is a very particular um, design to assess what you can reuse from what's there. And, and can the equipment accommodate, you know, just running a little harder, running a little more? Will it just be a little less efficient? Um, don't, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress, right? <laughs> Everything can be better. Um, it's just a question of um, trying to reach that more, most best solution for your house. I have, I have two questions if I could uh, ask them. Uh, the first is in a previous home, I had a mini split system because we had excellent radiant heat cast iron radiators. And we did install a mini split system to air condition the home. We would use the mini split to heat the home early spring into the early fall season. But I found the air with the mini split to be incredibly dry. Um, I take it though, with a heat pump, you can humidify, humidify the air through the um, air handler. Yes. Okay. Humidification is easy. It will never compare to radiant heat. The forced air systems, no matter whether it's you know a furnace or a heat pump, will be drier. So humidification will be necessary, and that is a bit of a downside of many splits. As well, any forced air system. system is going to dry. The, it's going to reduce the relative humidity. It is not going to change the absolute humidity, which is some of the, oh, maybe I shouldn't even say that. Forget it. <laughs> um, and my second question is, could you speak a little bit more on, you mentioned um, the installation of an electric heating coil in the air handler to supplement the um, heat pump on exceptionally cold days, does that, can that alleviate having to have a gas furnace backup for a heat pump? Yes. Short answer, yes. But could you talk a little bit more about, you know, just how that, because um, I this is the first I've heard of it, of the um, heat coil in the air handler, because uh, that seems to be a very inexpensive option to uh, it is. Very yeah. It's like I said, four hundred dollars. Imagine a toaster coil, the little red coils in your toaster. And you're just blowing the air across it to supplement yeah. the heat. Yeah. It's, it's not efficient. Easy. Like it's not. It's right. expensive. You wouldn't want to run it all the time. It is there as a backup. So, um, in terms of, um, you know, power failure or whatever, you know, if your gas furnace isn't going to run when the power's out either. Has to have an energy yeah. source. I've had clients tell me, I'm never going to not have a gas furnace because what if the power goes out? Guess what? Your gas furnace also doesn't work when the power's out. So if you have a power supply issue, uh, you need a, a generator. But the toaster oil thing that's sitting in what is, you know, the furnace in this heat pump situation is just an air handler, it's just moving air. And you're just adding that heat, extra heat source. Again, it's those clients of mine didn't do it. They never got below 66 because of the improved technology of heat pumps. It's, it's light years different now than even 10 years ago, the technology. So how much, will, how much will the temperature increase though with that coil in the air? About 40 degrees. Yeah, it's a lot. It'll do a lot. Again, you don't want to run it all the time. It's no, no, right. one more consideration though. If you decide to go that route, you're going to have an additional heat, or I'm sorry, electric load for that electric resistive heat, which means that the service, the breaker, and everything else associated with it is going to have to be larger. So thanks for your factor of that cost. Well, how many amps would you say in, in the panel or something like that? Oh, at least 40 to 50? Really? Yeah. So my I have this exact setup in my house. We have a cold climate heat pump doing the primary heating and cooling. We have an air handler. We have a toaster. 
in our in our wine. And it literally looks like a toaster. Yeah, that's what's called. Called. They pulled it out of the box, it looked like a giant toaster. I mean, if I stuck it in front of some writing, which is crisp. <laughs> uh, but the uh, it is a 60 amp unit, uh, and there's a Honeywell controller yeah. that decides when it comes on and when it shuts off. There's a circuit breaker on it. Uh, but my house, we also were doing a service upgrade in that renovation. So we have a 200 amp service line to the building. And so we, and we, we the, the moral of the story is to plan these things and design <laughs> these things. Because if you're trying to, do, if your furnace goes out and you try to make this upgrade and you want to make the upgrade with no heat in December, it's very challenging, right? So this is something that takes some time. It takes some consideration. Every house is different. You know, some people have historic homes. Some people have homes where, I mean, I've seen homes where there's all the ducks are wrapped in asbestos, right? So, you know, I mean, there's there's lots of things to consider with everybody's existing home. And so when you are trying to go from, you know, an inefficient system that isn't keeping you comfortable, that's costing you a lot of money to operate and maintain to a modern system, whether it's gas or electric, it's something you should do when the system's still running, not when it's dead, right? Because then you don't want to be under the gun. Um, as far as the load calculation goes, this is probably the biggest point. If you do move from a gas to a heat pump system, so typically your air conditioner, right, is going to have a 20 or 30 amp circuit. Or both, yeah, yeah. depending on the size. Yeah. And so if you typically just swap that out for a heat pump, you can probably do it without affecting Correct. The uh, the electric service would be identical. Okay. But if you are actually, more, it, would have, it would go down with the modern equipment. Yeah, because they're more efficient. Absolutely. So so I. But if you are considering adding an electric backup, and why would somebody add electric backup instead of a heap of gas furnaces backup? Is there a practical reason? Just if you're trying to go all electric with your house, yeah. more money. Yeah. The yeah. gas bill, right? So if you don't need, if you don't need gas for backup, why pay? Because a, a right. gas fired furnace is going to be at least a thousand dollars for a contractor. That's not even counting, you know, what the ultimate cost is to the end user, right? A toaster that we can just literally take two screws out, pull a cover off, slide this baby in there, hook up about five, six wires out of yours. So I think big that, difference, right? I think that that electric centralized electric backup, like the toaster in the, in the air supplies, is is a legit way to do it. But you yeah. got to make sure electric service is ready for that. So if you have a 200 amp service, you're probably okay. But if you have a 100 amp service, you're probably going to need to upgrade. So that toaster is expensive to run, right? Oh yeah, it is. It is. Okay. Yeah, we we, we backup have, only. <laughs> we, we actually emergency. It's called emergency heat. I, I don't trust the controller, right? I shut it off at the breaker. And if if I see it's gonna be negative 20 polar vortex, I go up there and turn it off. And let the controller do it. Yeah, because you don't want to risk it that's deciding right. to turn itself off. Yeah, because you're not gonna know until you get the bill and you're like, oh wow, that's that's serious. Um, there was a question. It's smaller. It's smaller than this. Right, yeah, I, I guess I have. I just want to finish this conversation and move on with the ducks. But okay, so what you're saying is the toaster is probably a better option than say your 20 year old furnace that's sitting there and free. I'm not spending your money, but you know, if it is in decent operating condition, you can still utilize it. Yeah. Why not? And go with a hybrid system and wait for it to fail. Now, once it fails, now you, you're faced with another decision. Do I go all electric or do I stick with the dual fuel and go more efficient with the dual fuel? And then second on the ductwork. Yes. You're saying, so is this what you were talking about? Um, so it was interesting. I had to have some ductwork done on a remodel on a kitchen and found that the, the ducts are just pushed together. They're not even screwed or taped, right? This is like a 55 year old house. You know, so so so, so you're saying they're not airtight. Right? I don't think so. So you're talking about something where you actually go in and you you 
you spray something yeah, in the arrow. See, yeah. see that? It'll see feel them? a quarter inch gap. Even. Oh, That's I've seen it oh, hole that big in the duct. Now, as long as you put a screen over it where it can catch the particulate matter, it will seal it. Okay. A but two inch round hole. But if you have the diagnostics done first, you can tell whether it's. That you'll do it. Yes. Because Maybe when you do a fracturization. <laughs> When you pressurize your ductwork, they're going to use theatric fog to tell where the duct is leaking from, all right? Because we can put, put a machine on there and say, oh, yeah, well, we're not getting 50 pascals, so this is, you know, you got to leak somebody. Well, it's all got to come out, right? No, not necessarily. You put, you inject a little fog into it, and then you can see that leaks, that leaks, and the rest of it's fine. One, one of the things that I, I want to point out is, you know, yeah. HVAC yeah. contractors are fantastic at making sure they can get you the right equipment, the right sizing, you know, and you get a good HVAC contractor and get things there. Uh, but sometimes you have to have an HVAC contractor and an insulation contractor who typically does air seam. Usually the, these, these products are using the same I hate to cut off this question and answer session, but we have a whole another question and answer session behind these doors. And those are some of the local area vendors that do HVAC services. Um, you can also continue to ask our experts any questions that you still have. I just want to give you that opportunity to actually talk to the vendors and see what they what options they may have for your home, whether you have a unique you know, architectural digest home or whether you're building a new home, whatever you have, I'm sure these people can hopefully answer some of those questions and give you the sense of, okay, I can go with this right now or maybe I should be asking more questions in the future and, and planning this out. So thank you so much for joining us today. If you thought this was useful, this is being recorded. If you your family, if you your friends, check it out on the HB website. They can watch this. And we will have future speaker series for the Sustainability Advisory Group on other sustainable um, technologies in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, the presenters and the moderator. You guys are wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Oh, really? Oh, are you upset about it? No, 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 it's all right.